welcome. Welcome to this session on building trust in AI. Thank you so much for being here. I know you're all excited for this entire session to be about ChatGPT. So, um, we'll, we'll, we, we may touch on aspects of that particular capability in large language models, but today we're gonna to be talking about the general topic of building trust in AI, and we'll look at that from different perspectives from our panelists that we have here. So again, thank you for being here. I'll be the moderator this afternoon. My name is Dave Broyles. Uh, I'm, I work with the Center for Naval Analyses where I direct our special activities and intelligence program where we do operations research and cyber and special operations and AI and autonomy. So I'm very excited to be hosting this panel this afternoon, particularly where we are uh, both within what we're, what we're grappling with with this, these new technologies and capabilities and where they are and the explosion that is currently happening around the globe just in the last six months, again, from what we're seeing uh, emerging from these large language models. So thank you again for being here. We're gonna be addressing this question, what will it take to develop the level of trust and transparency necessary for greater autonomous applications in our AI systems? So I think if you've been following this area for a while, you already are familiar with the fact that there's been lots of publications and ideas on this. In fact, that slide up there shows just, just a small sampling of, of the many books that have come out over the last five to 10 years on this particular topic. And they all have different ideas about what this is gonna mean. Various organizations have been promulgating frameworks. Uh, the NIST, uh, just earlier this year, published its AI risk management framework, which is what you see on the lower side of that slide. And if we all just kind of glanced at this, we'd all probably see what's written there and kind of go, oh, yeah, that, th th that looks reasonable and whatever. But you know, it says a lot of things that have a lot of that imply a lot of depth. What, what does it really mean to be secure and resilient and safe? We certainly wouldn't want things to be unsafe. So what, what does that mean? What do we do with that? And that framework, if you, hadn't, if, you, if you haven't seen it, starts to lay out in greater detail what that actually means. But at the end of the day, we have engineers and programmers who are sitting down and building these systems, and they've got these things in mind as well. What do they do when they're going to their keyboard or their storyboard or whatever so that they can be sure that when they're designing the system that they're, that they're doing, that, that what they're achieving is gonna come out with these aims of being privacy enhanced. And I, I'm sure we also can know pretty readily we could agree on things that we don't want out of, uh, out of where these systems could be headed. Uh, certainly some of the latest Hollywood blockbusters often highlight those undesired outcomes. And we, again, would all agree, well, we certainly don't want those sort of things to happen, but, but how do we, what sort of safeties do we need to put in place, and how do we go about that in a deliberate way that can help us to avoid those sorts of outcomes? And then on the other side, we've got the, the, the operators, the people that are gonna be using these systems. So we're gonna be handing systems over to people to then go execute their mission or their job or whatever function they're performing. They need to have confidence in what they're being handed works properly and, and, and will help them achieve what they're trying to do in, in a safe and secure fashion, and again, all those fancy words. And that's, it, it's hard to connect those dots, and we've seen a lot of effort on trying to help bridge the gap between those two sides of the coin, as it were. So that's a little bit about what we're gonna to be touching on today. Now, again, already alluded to, uh, in the meantime, everything is moving forward at an ever rapid pace. Um, been following this for a long time now, and again, maybe if you, if you, if you dial it back five or six years and you, you remember the advent of transformers as a technology, you wouldn't be so, so surprised about where we are today, but maybe the rapidity at which it has happened has been rather surprising. So, uh, right, we've seen massive advances in computer vision, image classification, natural language processing, and of course now generative AI and what we're seeing with the large language models. So let's start there now. Uh, what are we seeing now and where are we headed? Uh, this afternoon, we've got three panelists with us who are gonna have different perspectives about where things are and, and what kind of they're concerned about and how they're thinking about all these broad topics uh, as we're trying to incorporate this new technology and capability into our daily lives. With us this afternoon, we have 
Vice Admiral Kevin Lunday, who is triple-headed as the Commander Atlantic Area for the Coast Guard, uh, Commander Coast Guard Defense Forces East, and also the Director of the Department of Homeland Security Joint Task Force East. Um, basically responsible for much of what happens in the East Coast uh, waterways in the U.S. and responsibility for uh, defense of the U.S. when it comes uh, under the Homeland Security um, uh, hat. We also have with us Jason J. Meal uh, from SAIC. He is the Director of Data Science and Chief Data Science for SAIC's AI Innovation Factory. He leads AI technical strategy and solutions there. He also serves as a technical advisor to numerous intelligence organizations within the IEC and the Department of Defense. And he's working on things such as ISRT and algorithmic warfare. And finally, we have Dr. Matt Turek, who is with DARPA. He is the Deputy Office Director uh, for the Information Innovation Office, I2O. And he provides technical leadership and works with program managers to envision, create, and transition capabilities. Now, he was previously um, a program manager for a variety of programs, and uh, for the past five or six years, I've been co-hosting a podcast on AI, and we often talked about the various DARPA programs that were being created, always uh, amazed at the acronyms that were, that were coming up, always very creative, um, and I certainly recognize a number of these, uh, media forensics, semantic forensics, machine common sense, explainable AI, and the reverse engineering deception of AI exploration program. So, gentlemen, thank you all for being here. Uh, it's gonna be a great discussion. I've asked our panelists to just provide some opening remarks about kind of where they are and again, what they're seeing. And we're just gonna go down the line and based on that discussion, then we're gonna roll into a question and answer amongst ourselves where we kind of play off of the dialogue that's been going on uh, from, from the themes that are arising and the things that we're discussing. So with that, Admiral Lundy, over to you. Great, David, thank you very much. And it's great to be up here with Jay and Matt. Um, I'm surrounded by three deep technical experts and leaders in the field of AI, doing work in industry and government. Um, and so it's, just, it's great to be up here, very honored to be part of the panel today. <clears throat> you see AI is all over us, it's around us in the news. We've certainly heard the Secretary of the Navy and the CNO talk about it today. But I think the two big stories last week that caught my attention, one was, um, you may remember this, uh, the generative AI program um, Mid Journey developed this image of the Holy Father, Pope Francis, in a white, fashionable puffy coat that went viral. Uh, did anyone see that? Please raise your hand. It was a big deal on Reddit. I, I, we haven't seen uh, the Commandant of the Coast Guard wearing a big blue puffy coat, <laughs> but I'm sure there's an enterprising young Coast Guardsman that's uh, hard at work trying to generate that AI right now. Um, there was a, also a report about uh, a letter signed, open letter, uh, signed by Elon Musk and Steve Wozniak and many others raising concerns about uh, continuing to uh, develop large, um, um, more powerful AI models than uh, GPT-4 by OpenAI. And as you actually look beyond the hype of the, some of the social media and press reporting and you actually read the letter, what their letter was about was about making sure that as we advance AI uh, in the way that they're concerned about, that we have good governance we have um, risk management in place, and that we have a body of law and regulations and policy underneath it. Um, and so, although there was some controversy about the letter, it seemed uh, very relevant to me. And then I think the news this morning was the president was meeting with um, the Office of Science and Technology in the White House today on AI. And so it's certainly relevant. And I think all of that reflects the fact that this is a topic that has seized the, intra, the um, awareness and interest and concern um, of the American public and of our allies and others because not only of the opportunity that AI provides in all the different ways uh, that it can uh, function and enhance human performance and replace in some ways the tasks that humans may do, but also that a concern for the risks that it may bring as well, which are not yet well understood outside a small group of very technical experts that understand it really well. And so I think um, what I would say, my takeaway from that is as we reach for the opportunity that AI provides to us with one hand, we need to reach with the other hand to manage the risks that will come with the application of that disruptive technology. 
not necessarily disruptive in a bad way, but just changing, profound changes that it may bring. You know, when we train our officers in the Coast Guard, almost all of them sail aboard the Eagle. It's a tall ship. And they lay aloft into the rigging, and the rule, the first rule is one hand for yourself and one hand for the ship. Never turn both your hands to the task or you're going to fall. And I, that's how I think about AI. We need to keep one hand on the risk management as we reach for the opportunity. But I also think um, as we look at where AI is going, that it's not just about opportunity. There is an urgency because of the context of the strategic competition the United States and our allies are in with the pacing challenge of the People's Republic of China. And I would encourage, if you haven't read the National <clears throat> AI Commission's report um, that was finished in, I think, 2020 or 2021, mm -hmm. it describes in a very, that Eric Schmidt and, and Secretary Work led, it describes in very clear terms the challenge we're after <clears throat> and the urgency that moving ahead at speed because we're in the strategic competition. I think there are some then that raise a concern, hey, we, we really may struggle to be able to manage the risk and um, implement a very complex risk management framework that, uh, that, that NIST framework that David referred to earlier. And I think we maybe have some parallels with how we did that in the cybersecurity world. And it's framed as a trade-off. We can either move fast with AI or we can build a trustworthy system with all of those attributes that the risk management framework lays out. And I reject that framing of it as a choice between one or the other. Uh, we must move together not only to reach for and seize the opportunity that AI provides in all the different applications, but we must manage the risk as we go forward. Trustworthy and transparent AI is absolutely essential. I mean, if you look at the NIST framework that was up on the slide, there were 11 different words, attributes of that framework. And if you actually dig into what NIST put out there under Department of Commerce, it, there's a lot of meaning behind every single one of those 11 words. And it's important, we must have trust in AI and the capability it provides. Uh, that's essential to our way forward. We're not starting, we, we are on a good path. Um, the Department of Defense uh, is already put out, uh, certainly in the, we talked about the national security strategy, the national military strategy, or defense strategy, military strategy, but there's a, a DOD um, AI and responsible pathway, uh, responsible AI and pathway forward that lays out the Department of Defense's way forward. And I know Dr. Martell is the chief um, data analytics uh, officer, um, is leading a lot of that effort for the Department of Defense along with the other services. And while the Coast Guard is within Homeland Security and we align with DHS, we are very closely tied into uh, what is going on in the Department of Defense and some of the AI applications that are happening there. And I look forward to talking about those more in the Q&A. But we started in the Coast Guard, I think, a few years ago with a journey, with an understanding that we had a lot to do before we were going to position ourselves to be really, in a, really ready to, to embrace AI in the way we need to. And it started with, and Dr. Martel talks about this frequently, we have to get the data right. So over the last two years, we've put out a data strategy. We now have an office of data and, and analytics and are beginning to put the building blocks in place that are necessary, not just the algorithms or the applications, but the data, the infrastructure, and then underneath that, the people. And let me just conclude, I would say, with some of the key principles we have come out in the Coast Guard that we have affirmatively stated when it comes to AI data and then the AI that will rely on that data to generate effect. Number one, people are more than data and more important than technology. People are more than data and more important than technology. And we will bring our values, our core values and our ethics uh, to this journey that we're on. It's absolutely essential that we never lose sight of that. And that that only goes for our people but the American people whose information and whose data we are entrusted with. And so that is a guiding way forward for us, um, and we are relying on the, the path that DOD has set out is part of the, most of the journey that we're on as well. And then I look forward to, um, to talking a little bit more about some of the specifics of what we're doing on our AI journey. Thank you very much, David. All right, thank you, Adam. Jay, over to you.
Uh, thank you all uh, for having me here today. I appreciate being on the stage with you folks uh, to talk about AI. Um, we're focusing a lot at the, not only at the strategic level, but all the way down to the, the tactical level of how we integrate and operationalize AI into systems today for the analyst, the operator, the warfighter. Um, and this is a great discussion to be having because I think what a lot of folks think about when they talk about AI is, you know, how quickly can I get, you know, AI to infer on an image or how quickly can I get it to generate text like we're talking about with things like ChatGPT 3 There's my one. That's the only time I'll say it. <laughs> mm -hmm. But the, the reality is we really need to focus on this reliability framework because we're talking about, to the Admiral's point, people's lives, right? Whether it's American people's lives or servicemen's lives or anyone that's going to be interacting with this AI, we have to focus on trust. So, you know, we see over the past couple of years it's been, there's been an explosion in technology. So storage is commoditized now. Compute is commoditized now. Uh, I was actually with Dr. Martel this morning, and we were talking about how even models are commoditized to some degree now. So now that we know that we have the technology and the capability to implement these, you know, different strategies with AI, we have to start talking about what does it actually bring to the fight? So what we center all of our discussions on are utility uh, and usability and trustworthiness. So just I'll, I'll frame a lot of what I'm talking about today around these three things, so just a quick explanation. What we mean by utility is what does AI bring to the fight today? What can we do today to fundamentally change how the analyst, the operator, the warfighter interacts with data on a daily basis? And part of that discussion has to be how do we democratize it and make it easier for anyone, technical and non-technical, to be able to interact with. Mm -hmm. The second thing, and, and that leads into the usability piece, right? How, how do we make it so that anybody can, can use that technology? And the third is the trustworthiness. It's great to say, hey, I can do an inference and I can maybe fuse different types of intelligence and I can tell you with, you know, 99% certainty that that particular object is ABC. But the real question is, prove it, right? That should be the next question, prove it. And so the ability to talk about explainability around AI and interpretability of models and invertibility of models so that you can really understand uh, in a non-technical way as well as a technical way from ingest of the data to inference on the data, what that actually means to the warfighter and how the decision was made. And getting away from these black box ideas and moving into these explainable models I think will go a long way towards that trust. So that's what, that's what I'm working on on a daily basis. Great, thanks Jay. And Matt, over to you. Great. Um, happy to be here. I appreciate the, the opportunity to talk about uh, what is, I think, a really very important topic. Um, I'm going to start with a comment or two on history just to give you a sense of the lens uh, that I look at things through. Uh, so I'm at uh, DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. We actually sit under the Undersecretary of Defense for Research and Engineering. DARPA was formed in 1958 in response to Sputnik. Right, an event that uh, created strategic surprise for the U.S. It took a one and a half page memo to stand up DARPA as an agency. Imagine trying to pull that off uh, today. <laughs> the mission of DARPA, which again is the lens through which uh, we look at these sorts of problems, is to prevent and impose strategic surprise, impose on adversaries. And DARPA's been a, a long-term investor in AI. So the agency itself, 1958, our investments date back into the early, uh, into the early 60s. Um, some of those investments led to what we refer to as the first wave in AI. So that is symbolic or sort of rules-based approaches. Uh, and then continual investments led to what we refer to as second wave AI. It's really statistical machine learning approaches. Those are what's driving all the innovation of that we're hearing today around uh, things like uh, large language models. And as impressive as those capabilities seem to be, I'm not sure that they're going to get us to the fully trustworthy capabilities we're ultimately going to want from a DOD and IC and a national security perspective. And I think part of that is because there's a fundamental misalignment between what industry is doing and what a DOD ultimately uh, needs. Uh, that doesn't mean that we should ignore what industry is doing. I think there are many compelling capabilities there, uh, and we should look uh, to use them. Uh, but industry isn't focused on those sorts of life and death uh, problems uh, that the other panelists mentioned. They also have access to massive amounts of data and compute, and that's not always the case for the sorts of problems we work on in the DOD. 
We care a lot about unusual events sometimes. Those are the ones we might care the most about. By definition, there's not a lot of training data available for those. So that's some example of, I think, some of the fundamental misalignment uh, in cases between industry and DOD needs. Um, and uh, you know, one of uh, DARPA's missions, again, around uh, preventing surprise is to, to remedy some of those uh, gaps. Uh, we've been thinking about how to address some of those problems, and, and really we think about it along uh, really three lines of effort. Uh, further needs and foundational theory around AI systems uh, to support AI engineering as an actual discipline. Uh, and then really the third uh, line of effort is uh, human-machine teaming, human-machine symbiosis. Uh, that's the language that we use in I2O, uh, sort of dating back to JCR Licklider, who was one of the early office directors uh, at, uh, at DARPA. Um, that fundamental science, the ability to make measurements, to understand AI systems, to understand intelligence broadly, to understand human intelligence, is really the foundation for building things like trustworthy systems. The current paradigm oftentimes uh, today is to build a machine learning system by trial and error. We no longer build bridges by trial and error. We don't build a bridge, drive a distribution of vehicles over it, see if it falls down. If it does, we build it differently, drive that same distribution or a different distribution of vehicles over it. We understand how far we need to span with a bridge, what sort of load it needs to carry, how do I break that down into trust, wor into trust work, what sort of standard beams can I use for that trust work, what level of deflection uh, do, they need to, uh, do they need to support. That's an example of decomposition and system engineering, and that's something that, while the community broadly is heading towards that, I think we're far from it from an, from an AI perspective. Those sorts of tools would allow us to build AI systems in a rigorous, uh, in a rigorous way. And then finally, though, that human-machine interaction, uh, you know, that's fundamental to trust, being able to define what do you mean by trust? It's a contextual, um, it really needs to be defined contextually. There are definitions out there in the, in the research community. What are the level of resources that we need to uh, build state-of-the-art AI systems? What's the impact on uh, energy and climate from uh, building those, uh, those large systems? How do we have uh, AI systems that anticipate what humans need, are in alignment with human values? Again, all of these, I think, are core uh, challenges that we need to, to get after to ultimately get to highly trustworthy uh, AI systems. So, uh, I'll leave that, uh, I'll leave off there. I uh, just wanted to provide a little bit of framing and, and hopefully some fodder for the discussion. All right, well, thank you, gentlemen. Uh, great setup for uh, where we are when, with dealing with these technologies and how we're thinking about using them and, and how, how we're dealing with our concerns. Now, one of the topics that came up in, in the uh, remarks here was about the data. So I, I'd kind of like to dig a little bit deeper on that, on that topic initially here. Um, and just get some perspective. My, my sense was, and this is before having to worry about big data and what has, what has grown out of that, that whole science, is data's always been difficult. Um, you know, we'd go to try to do an analysis for uh, some sort of uh, program office or, or something else, and we'd say, well, let's see your data. Um, we'd get the data and it would be full of holes, it would be incomplete, right, all, all, all those sorts of things. And it's, it, it doesn't strike me that a lot of those issues have changed, uh, it's just now we have lots more data. So uh, I wonder if you might comment kind of where we are even just on wh when, when you go into uh, a new project or something like that and you're trying to figure out the data or even just as a service, trying to set forth the foundation for what's gonna be a solid data foundation or whatever you wanna call it. How, how, how have those challenges changed over the last few years given, given everything else that's going on? Anyone want to start on that? Sorry. Yeah, David, I think I, I could start. I think the Coast Guard has been on, for about two years now on a, <clears throat> a journey on, on, on learning about data. And, and some of what I'm going to say is, it will sound kind of funny to many of you because it sounds like really you guys didn't, you were that sort of that fundamental in where you were starting. We used to say, hey, we don't have the capability to do big data and that's what we need to focus, focus on. And I think what we first realized is we have a small data capability gap. Um, and so we began to look at our data and the first thing we said was, well, let's go back and let's tag and label all of our historical legacy data that we have. 
and we had some great experts from industry come in and say, number one, don't do that. <laughs> uh, you all are going to collect more data in the next, two year, next three years in the U.S. Coast Guard than in your entire 233-year history. So focus forward, except for those specific areas where you need to go back and label and tag. That was very helpful. The second one was start with very difficult questions you need to get after and dig into those. And, and then the third was make sure you have a, a standard way you are approaching the taxonomy for data labeling and tagging that aligns with DOD, with, uh, with DHS, with national standards so that you are on a strong footing. And so that's really the path we've been on uh, in the Coast Guard under our new Office of Data and Analytics to move forward and then begin to, to speed up. And I think to CNO Gilday's point at lunch where he said, you know, we're, we're going to move slow to move fast. Uh, now we're beginning to see speed as we, we pick up momentum on the data piece. I'll just add, so uh, being in that position a lot, working with mission partners across the DOD and the IC and asking for data sets to solve problems in their, in their space, uh, I can definitely attest to the fact that the largest part of the problem is the data, the foundational data. So whether it's, it's access to the data uh, and being able to get it, uh, or the fidelity of the data, uh, so, you know, just is it, is it the right data um, or is it even labeled? the sparseness of the data in a lot of ways. You know, what, what Matt was saying. Some of it is just event-driven, right? We don't have a lot of data on certain things, but a lot of it is also it's just not there or it's, it, you know, it's missing. Um, so these are all challenges, and I think one of the things that we ne really need to focus on is really understand that that whole, in the data science life cycle or the, or the you know, the model building life cycle, the shortest part of it is actually building the model and training the model. The, the other 60 to 70 percent is identifying the appropriate data, labeling the appropriate data, shaping the appropriate data, and making sure that it is ready to be fed into a model. So um, I think we need to develop uh, interoperability standards, uh, and I think we need to develop uh, systematic ways to automate a lot of the data tagging. Um, been working on that for a number of years. I can tell you that labeling data sets is not fun. Uh, <laughs> Nor is, it, uh, nor is it very enriching or, or mentally stimulating, but it's important. Um, so I think the ability to tag data, ingest automatically, tag data, um, and fundamentally condition and enrich that data uh, to be able to share it is extremely important. And, and sir, to your point uh, about the ontologies and the taxonomies, that's also very important. Uh, I run into that every day, and, and my joke when, when I'm sitting with folks in a room is, everybody give me your definition of a tank, right? Something so simple. And we might all have a different definition, and my definition is it has water and fish, right? Mm -hmm. So we have to really think about what that means and keeping those standards uh, so that we can talk. I mean, we talk about JADC2, we talk about interoperability, we talk about these joint systems. So the labeling of the data and those standards around it and specifically what that data means in context uh, is going to go a long way towards building that trust. So, Jay, before we go to, go to Matt here, I'm, I'm curious, the and I, I speak on a large part of ignorance here, I occasionally remember someone coming out and trying to s establish, hey, these should be our data standards, right? <laughs> and if you're familiar with the comic XKCD, right, the, 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 the classic comic where someone says, hey, there, there are 16 standards in this area. Someone should really, you know, reduce those down to one standard. And then it's like, you know, later, there are now 17 standards. <laughs> so what... Who, who is anyone really driving that train or is this really everyone for themselves and we're in a Betamax VHS world where maybe eventually one thing will win and whoever gets the biggest you know, share of the pie kind of drives it? So I, I think it's a great question. Um, I, I, don't want, <laughs> I don't want to be cynical here. Uh, I think there's more than just Betamax and VHS. I think it's that and, 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 right? Mm -hmm. um, I, I know that uh, the Defense Intelligence Agency has worked a lot to try and build those standards and they've built out uh, the Defense Intelligence Core Ontology and the Joint Intelligence Core Ontology. But I think we're all just starting to have, and I've actually, I'm actually seeing that now, I was working with the Air Force, I actually saw that come up recently. Um, I think that folks have been at a maturity stage previously where they're, they're thinking, I, I need you know, AI to support targeting, or I need AI to support fires, or I need AI for force readiness. And they weren't thinking about how we're gonna get to that point. And now I think folks are taking a step back, which is really encouraging. Uh, and thinking, okay, I gotta get my data right and solve this problem first. So I think we're moving towards those standards and I think it's, 
discussion after discussion to try and help steer. And I think some of that's going to come from academia, some of it's going to come from industry, some of it's come, going to come from the missions itself, but I really think it starts with a level of education so that folks understand that having those standards is going to be key to achieving, you know, information overmatch. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Matt? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, developing those data standards, the ontologies, uh, is important and probably the right thing to do given the, the current state of technology, but things like ontologies can be useful for help, um, helping to frame our thinking, but they can also be constraining and they can be brittle, right? So. Uh, future technologies, unsupervised machine learning perhaps will allow us to, to not have to do as much uh, labeling, uh, to maybe have less structure that we need to impose uh, through ontologies and other approaches. Um, from a DARPA perspective, we're on the research end of the pipeline, so we don't really have necessarily those enterprise data concerns uh, that uh, you know, a service might. Um, but we have actually uh, unique uh, challenges. We have to deal with human subjects research, right? Mm -hmm. So operational organizations aren't doing that. They're not doing research. We're doing research. We have to work through an institutional review board mm -hmm. process. We have to deal with uh, DOD human research protection officers. Um, that's really important for protecting, uh, you know, individual rights. Um, but from a speed standpoint, that process is half a year sometimes in mm -hmm. length. Um, there's other challenges around utilizing publicly available information, commercially available information that triggers Intel oversight uh, reviews and planning. And so again, these, these bring unique challenges uh, from the perspective of trying to do that fundamental research. Uh, do it in ways, obviously, that protects the rights and liberties of people that um, are involved in the, the research process. And, and just to be clear, like human subjects research requires that consent uh, from individuals participating in the process, but also, you know, how do we make that go fast to deal with things like the pacing challenges that the Admiral mentioned? Right. So another theme that was coming up in our, in our initial discussion here was, uh, for lack of a better term, sort of the regulation issue or policy things that need to be in place or could be in place or, or should be in place. Um, if I, we were talking about this before we started the panel, but again, if you were, if you've been following the, the history of GPT, you may recall that back in 2021 uh, or thereabouts when OpenAI uh, attempted to release uh, Chat GPT, I think it was two, they said, um, right, the, the, the actual headlines were, uh, scientists worried that AI tool may be too dangerous to be released and that sort of thing, right? They, they, they made kind of a big show out of it, but it was, the, the, the line was, uh, you know, we're, this tool may be really powerful and we're kind of concerned about it, so we're gonna release a, a stupider version first that has fewer parameters and things, just to test the waters and see how things go. And, and, and they did, and then within a couple weeks, they're like, yeah, everything's fine, and they opened up the full model. And then fast forward, now, you know, chat, uh, GPT-3 gets released, then chat, and then four. And there was no, there was no stated concern anymore. All the restraints, at least from OpenAI, were off, and they were in a, one could say, in a rush to monetize it as quickly as possible. And so now we, we look at a letter being signed by a bunch of the leading researchers in the area that are urging caution, but you look at the momentum that has been, that has been built up, and it, it looks to be at like an insto uh, un, insto unstoppable object, right? Um, and wh what would be the un or what would be the unmovable object to, to stop it? Um, so, given all that, where we need to be potentially with regulation, or I'd just be kind of curious from your perspectives, what are you seeing about the types of discussions that are being going on? I know from the Coast Guard perspective, Coast Guard has responsibilities for providing regulation for maritime capabilities, and you've got companies and providers that are looking to take advantage of these capabilities, so you've got a different perspective on this. You've all got kind of a different piece on kind of what's going on in this area to kind of try to apply some, some amount of control and oversight on this. I just kind of would be curious on your, your perspective on what you're seeing for your particular piece of the pie here. All right, I'll go, yeah. I'll go first with that one. Um, so I'll, let me caveat a response by saying so I'm not a policy expert. Uh, you know, policy isn't uh, really uh, DARPA's uh, core remit. Um, I, think, I think there is cause for concern in this space. The, the speed at which uh, technology is moving uh, could 
could have some significant downsides. That's not around it's becoming sentient, it's becoming malevolent, it's AGI. Mm -hmm. I think it's simply the speed and scale at which these systems could operate. Mm -hmm. They could make decisions, and if they make wrong decisions, again, the speed and scale at which the impacts could be bad uh, could be unlike things that we've had to deal with uh, previously. Mm -hmm. I think one of the challenges from a, from a policy perspective is how do you construct regulations appropriately? I go back to that foundational science of how do you measure and evaluate AI systems. We don't have some of that foundational science. It's not like you can say, you need to have this level of trust score to operate in these particular domains, or you need this level of explainability mm -hmm. to operate in a particular domain. So I think that creates challenges for, uh, for policymakers. I think there's also just the, the, uh, the bigger context of uh, you know, AI being implemented on top of software and we don't necessarily have good policy around uh, robust and reliable software systems. Our, another part of our uh, office in, uh, in I2O is focused on secure and resilient systems and uh, building cyber defenses and things like that. The attack surface in software is massive. AI obviously is built on top of software and inherits all those, all those challenges. Mm -hmm. um, so one approach might be to step back and just look at what should we do for software systems writ large. Um, you know, I'd be concerned about um, getting into debates about what is AI, what is machine learning if you're going to try and write regulations. So I guess I would personally advocate for an approach, what's the Imp what's the potential impact of this software system? What's the harms uh, that could be caused? And, and perhaps that's a framing uh, that could be used not just for AI and machine learning systems, but also for, for software systems mm -hmm. writ large. Okay. Yeah, I, I would just say that I think it goes back to how we scope, how we solve problems. So, um, you know, a lot of the work that we're doing right now, you're always gonna have a human in the loop or a human on the loop to see or interpret what the decisions the AI is gonna make before it pulls a trigger, for example. Um, and I think that's really important because one of the things that we, you know, we, we talked about data, we talked a little bit about labeling, but let's talk about what, uh, and, and, and inference, but let's talk about what that means, right? So, you know, we'll use a, we'll use a pretty uh, uh, you know, sort of harmless example, I guess. Um, you go through TSA, right, and you put your bags on the, on the screener uh, belt, and you know, type, we, we, we deal with errors, right, and, and whether or not the machines are making correct inferences. And so we call, you know, a false positive doesn't cause me a lot of concern. A false positive when I put my suitcase up on the, on, on the, the belt, and it says, you know, I have a hand grenade in my bag, but it's actually a pineapple, that, that doesn't cause a lot of concern. It causes an inconvenience. But if you flip it, right, you think about, it says, nah, it's good, he's got a piece of fruit, but it's actually a weapon that could be used to hurt people. That's a false negative. Those, those keep me up at night. And a lot of that is sort of focusing on how do we um, bring it back to making sure the human is connected to the AI and making sure the human is making the ultimate decision right now. I think you probably agree we're probably pretty far away from well, we're definitely far away from AGI, so uh, you know, artificial general intelligence, uh, which would be like the things out of like Skynet or out of the movies that we <laughs> that we watch in Hollywood. Um, I also think we're far away, even though I'm I'm sure there's a lot of exploration into it. I think we're still probably somewhat far away from autonomous systems making decisions on their own. So fully autonomous systems making decisions on their own. And I think what this is gonna what this is gonna come down to in the whole. Di uh, you know, the whole discussion around it and as we build these regulations is really how much do we want to take away from the human, right? And so what, what we're focusing on a lot of the time for mission right now to make these things operational is this human machine teaming that you talk about. To me, the, the artificial intelligence of today that's operationalized across the services is more about reducing the cognitive load on the user, whoever, the operator, the analyst, the warfighter. Um, you can be the best at your job in the world, but it's the way data is thrown at us right now and the ubiquitous nature of all the information coming in from sensors and sources and commercial data feeds and PAI and, and maritime information and overhead, whatever it might be, that's a lot, 
right? So let's play to the strengths of the artificial intelligence. Instead of trying to solve the problem all at once, right? Bite off a little bit of time. Let's play to the strengths of the systems right now, which is finding signals in the noise. It's very good at that. Finding anomalies, looking for things that might not be right. Tipping and cueing a warfighter or an analyst or an operator and focusing there first and providing model feedback. So what you end up doing is by sort of bifurcating the problem, you're allowing the machine to do what it does best, which is look for these things, and you're allowing the warfighter, the analyst, the operator, or end user to do best, which is the strategic thinking, the human part. And you can build these systems, right, and eliminate some bias, and you can do a lot more progress and work by having the human input at the end. And that's the feedback loop piece that we didn't talk about yet. But taking those decisions and when it says, you know, that's a pineapple and it's right or wrong, telling the machine it's wrong, of course, but also telling it when it's right, because that helps it continue to learn and reinforce the parameters that it's using to make the decisions. So I think we talk a lot about AI, but I think the humans have a real role in guiding and, and shaping how this is going to play out over the next, you know, 10 or 20 years. Jay, to pick up on something you, you you mentioned there, and it, it was a line in the National Security uh, Commission on Artificial Intelligence report that really struck me. It said, as we increasingly rely on machines, the central guiding principle across national security scenarios will be the cent centrality of human judgment. I think that's a really important concept. Again, back to the, uh, the people uh, piece of that. The Coast Guard's role is, is a different than the other military services in the sense that we are also a regulatory agency for the marine transportation system. So vessels, mariners, um, port facilities, across our ports and waterways, in, in all of the ways that uh, that MTS is critical to our national security and economic prosperity. <clears throat> so the Coast Guard, understanding that um, industry, maritime industry, is reaching for the advantage that AI and autonomous systems will provide. We went out about, um, about 18 months ago in the Federal Register as part of a normal process and we asked for input from the public and from maritime industry. Tell us how you are going to, the journey you're on to embrace uh, AI and autonomous systems and other disruptive technologies so we can understand how to better position the Coast Guard to be ready to fulfill our role as a regulatory agency responsible for the safety uh, and security of the MTS. And so we need to be positioned to understand what industry is doing and we're seeing industry reach for autonomous vessels, um, increasingly bring uh, AI and uh, human machine teaming into port and facility operations. And so we need to gain the proficiency and understanding to fulfill our responsibility, legislative and, and uh, regulatory responsibility, to, um, to, to the maritime industry and to the public to ensure safe navigation and the functioning of the MTS. So that's a, another part of what we do um, on this journey. So another theme that's come up in these, um, in the things that we've been talking about is, is that of transparency. And we can, th there's numerous layers of transparency that we could certainly talk about and, and I, I would want to explore some of those now. Uh, we certainly have the transparency of the user interfacing with a, a tool or cap capability, whether they can understand or have some way to interrogate or under, you know, get a better sense of how uh, an answer or an output was derived, uh, how, how did the system come to this conclusion. But then there's also the transparency of, say, at the higher level, which is I'm going to now employ such a capability or such a system. Does it employ an auto autonomous capability? Sort of like if I go to the, the supermarket and I want to buy something, uh, people care now about whether something has gluten in it or, or not, and or whether, you know, this this thing was made on a machine that pro may process nuts. Like, I would care about that if I had a nut allergy. And so we've all determined that that's, that's the sort of information that can be communicated to me. It's not clear at this point that necessarily these types of things need to be communicated when it comes to, hey, I'm gonna provide you a new service here, but um, you know, don't look under the hood. Or even if you asked me to look under the hood, I couldn't tell you because it, it, it doesn't have a hood. <laughs> so uh, there's a lot of layers there of transparency. Uh, I, I just would kind of be curious about your thoughts about what you're seeing about ways to help to try to make things more clear at, at, at all levels. Um, I guess I'll give, a, I'll give a little bit of framing informed by uh, running DARPA's explainable AI program uh, for a few years, um, a program that was started by a previous uh, program manager at DARPA, Dave Gunning. Um, so one point I think that's important to make is that an explanation isn't an artifact. Uh, you shouldn't think about the system produces the explanation 
Um, this was something we came to appreciate, or at least let's say the AI and machine learning uh, researchers came to appreciate during the course of the program. Explanation should really be a process. I think the psychologists that were on the program, the human factors folks that were on the program sort of understood that going in. I think it took a while for uh, some of us in the, the AI and machine learning research community to, to really understand that. So, um, so I think that's one important point. Uh, another is that uh, you know explanation or transparency or the, the ability to introspect depends on where you are in the life cycle of an AI system. So the needs for a developer or a subject matter expert working with a machine learning researcher you know, they need to understand how to debug and update and improve the performance of a system. That's different than the folks that are doing test and evaluation to sign off on a system that's going into operational use. That's different from the end user who needs to understand why was a particular decision made. And it's different from policy makers or commanders who have, let's say, hybridized uh, human and AI teams. You know, is the pattern of uh, decisions defensible uh, from that system or from that group. So just very different sorts of needs uh, for uh, explanation, for introspection throughout the, uh, throughout the life cycle. So, you know, again, this I think is one of the challenges around um, uh, just understanding the area broadly. It's not like, well, if we do this one thing for explanation, we're gonna be fine. We really need solutions across that entire spectrum. And I think the, uh, the level of transparency may vary, or the demand for it uh, may vary depending on the risk involved in the application of AI. Mm -hmm. And so <clears throat> we can imagine, so some of the work that we're doing now, which I think the other services are doing as well, is related to our logistics and supply chain and parts uh, inventory and how we can gain efficiencies in that process. Um, and it's fairly incremental work, it offers great benefit, uh, but it doesn't present a lot of risk in terms of you know, individuals or, or privacy or, um, equity and, and other critical, um, uh, critical areas to individuals. But if we begin to uh, look at, hey, how can we use um, advanced algorithms to be able to understand and do uh, force management or personnel management better, uh, then those aspects, uh, so for example, out of the NIST framework, that it's fair with the risk of human, uh, excuse me, the risk of um, harmful bias removed, uh, privacy um, is enhanced, those become much more critical. I mean, we can now, even with our challenges in our data sets, uh, we can paint a remarkable picture using available uh, public and government data about, uh, about, uh, about me. In fact, if I looked at all that data, um, I would probably be surprised to learn things about myself that I didn't even realize. Uh, but no matter how complete that picture is, it's only a reflection of the individual human being. It's not them. And so those principles be become very important, uh, for particularly when we talk about the impact on individuals. I also think to an earlier point you made, David, that we talked about reaching for opportunity and managing the risk at the same time. Um, I don't think we, we learned from the cybersecurity journey, you can't bolt the risk management framework on later. If we don't sustain or build and then maintain trust in AI um, and as, as broad as that term is and, and the applications, uh, then we will lose public trust in it and getting that back will be a very, very difficult thing to do. Uh, I'll just add uh, two <coughs> things that we're thinking about a lot when it comes to looking at transparency. I think we could talk about the transparency of the entire ecosystem. Um, and the life cycle of data science and artificial intelligence uh, in particular. So we, we've talked a little bit today about right, the data itself and making sure that it's transparent and we understand uh, what the data is. And we've talked a little bit, little bit about the models and understanding the transparency around the models and making sure that you can lift the hood and understand how the models are making decisions, at least to some degree, because there are certain things with neural networks where we're just not there yet. Um, but I, to take your question more literally, right? Like what do we need to understand that we're looking at or what should be labeled? I think w there's, there's two things we should talk about with respect to the data. First of all, what's the, the provenance of the data? Where did it come from? So we were having a discussion earlier uh, before, before this started. Um, we, we were e experimenting with generative AI and we're doing a lot with adversarial machine learning, which uh, is a topic that's becoming more and more important now that we're talking about operationalizing these technologies. 
Um, and I sent one of my teams out and I said, I want you to go and train a model uh, on everything it can learn about Ukraine and Russia. And we're gonna start asking it questions. But here's the thing, I don't want you to validate those data sets first. I don't want you to necessarily understand the provenance or the lineage of where that data came from. We're just gonna go do a test. So they went out and trained it on Reddit and Twitter, for example. <laughs> so then we started asking it questions, like you would ask ChatGPT questions. And one of the questions was, you know, is Russia a threat to the United States? And it was, nope, Russia's doing its thing, the United States is the aggressor, they're just trying to protect, you know, their interests, and, and so wherever you sit on the side of the, you know, politically on, on that question, the key is really understanding the transparency of where data came from. So I think that's one key I wanna talk about. Where did the data come from? Does it have the right fidelity? Do we understand that it's an authoritative source of truth even, right? And, and that can be, you know, it can be an extreme example like that, but it can also be an example just thinking, you know, service component to service component, if we're sharing information and someone's system has updated, and maybe that source system is not in sync with the, the, the system that's making the decisions, you know, we have to understand all of that, right, around, around transparency of the models. And the other thing I'll mention, because you, you brought this up earlier in our conversation, is what happens with all these external dependencies? So I talked about the commoditization of a lot of these tool sets, a lot of these models, and a lot of the language libraries, the large language models, the, the science models and things. There needs to be transparency around where those are being developed, where that technology is coming from. What are the internals of those systems? Because if we don't start thinking about those things and we pull a library up onto one of our networks and we you know, containerize it and put it into some type of a model, we might be exposing our information to an adversary. Uh, so I think when we're talking about transparency, we have to think about those areas as well. I think, David, also it would be important to just recall the Department of Defense um, Responsible AI Strategy and Implementation Pathway, which is all about a journey to trust. We talked about trust and transparency, and it, it begins with a, a clear uh, foundation in the law of armed conflict, in just war theory uh, that's well established, in weapons review and approval, and I'm not gonna give any specifics, but, but that's very clearly laid out that we start on that bedrock foundation um, that, that, it, that we're anchored in, um, and that's an important part of the transparency as well. So I'd like to try a little bit of a curveball here, or maybe, maybe feel free to pass on this one. It's, it's a little bit of looking things from the other side of it, which is we often talk about building trust as though it we're starting from zero. What happens when we build too much trust? <laughs> the, right, there, there, there's a, a sense of, we want to be at an appropriate level of trust, right? We, we don't want to trust too little, too, too much. But can, can you have, do you have any thoughts on what it looks like or the, the risks that we may have or are already having perhaps in cases where we're, we're, we're not asking the right questions or people are like, oh, good to go, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna run with it. Any, any thoughts on the idea of the, uh, that other side of trust? Maybe as the, the only non-technologist on the panel, I guess I would say that we're, we're sort of surrounded by AI applications every day and as consumers, as you know, and, maybe the path we're on offers an opportunity for us to be more skeptical about what we've in many ways taken and accepted as trustworthy and now we're beginning to realize, hey, actually, we ought to be more questioning about that. So I think the journey we're on to demand trust and transparency may help sort of walk us back and be smarter consumers and about the AI that surrounds us and impacts us every day already. I think this is a really good question. Um, what, what's too much, right? And I wouldn't call it too much trust. I would say, where do we get overconfident or where do we get arrogant in the systems being able to make the decisions? That's a great question. I haven't had a lot of time to think about that question. But again, I think we can govern that by as much as we can, looking at the level of risk of the task that, that the AI is, is gonna be you know, inferencing on or completing and decide, do we still want you know, a human in the loop there uh, or a human on the loop there to make those, um, to make those final decisions? Yeah, I agree with those uh, previous comments. I guess I'll add a little bit of uh, technical color here. Uh, again, from our explainable AI program, one of the things that we found is that humans interacting with AI systems have some of the same bias challenges that they have when they're interacting with humans, so anchor bias. If, the, if your first interaction with an AI system is positive, you may have a tendency to overtrust it. If it's negative, you may have a tendency to undertrust it. Uh, there are researchers looking at this in structured ways and trying to figure out, is there an optimal way to sort of present the relative strengths and weaknesses of an AI system to help calibrate trust in the user? 
Um, again, we don't have good quantitative measures of exactly what that looks like, but that is a problem that is uh, being worked in the research community. And again, I think this is an example of one of those foundational challenges uh, that you know, we really need to solve to ultimately get to the sort of systems we want. All right, we're getting close to the end of the session here, so I'll just kind of open up the, to our panelists. Any, any topics that you think we should uh, re-hit or, or dig on? a little bit further in the, in the few minutes that we've got left. I'll go. I guess sort of to continue the thread we were just talking about, um, sort of flipping it another way to look at it, uh, and the Admiral brought this up. We put, as individuals, a lot of trust into artificial intelligence, machine learning, or really data gathering every day, right? We wear a ubiquitous amount of sensors or interact with a ubiquitous amount of sensors on a daily basis. You have your Apple Watches, your iPhones, your you know, your Android technology, your Fitbits, you know, and, and everything in between. Um, as, as an intelligence professional, you have to really think, do we want all that information out there all the time, right? And so we, we talk about trusting these, these technologies, but the real question is, do you really trust giving all of this data, your biometric data, your, your personal data, uh, all the information to these systems or to these companies, um, and whether or not that data is truly safeguarded where that, that data might be going or what that data might be being used for. And I think that uh, not only is that something we have to look on sort of introspectively, right, as a, <laughs> as a human, we have to look at it from the perspective of war fighting. What are we gonna do with, with this data in the future? I'll uh, pick up on one of the, the comments uh, that Vice Admiral made early on, uh, which I'll translate as I want both trustworthy AI and I want it quickly, and I, and I think that's, that's an appropriate uh, thing to ask for. Um, I don't think that trade-off is as inherent as we might think it is. Um, on one of our uh, DARPA programs exploring um, urban reconnaissance with uh, supervised autonomy, that, uh, that program was focused on are there things that we can do to perturb the environment, watch the behavior of individuals in the environment to understand whether they're a threat or not comes with obvious ethical challenges. The DARPA approach was to embed an ethics team in the development process of the AI system itself. What that led to was focusing on some of the harder problems earlier in the development process. We got more robust capabilities, more operationally relevant capabilities, as determined by transition partners, looking at capabilities like, I want that. Um, versus a, a baseline system. So I think it is possible, actually, to do both. I'll give uh, briefly one more example. On our explainable AI program, by requiring explainability, we actually saw sometimes the models performed better. That's because they got additional supervision, there was additional requirements. Essentially, we were forcing the models to learn a better model of the world. So by requiring trust, or that, uh, that AI systems have attributes that lead to trust in humans, we may force them to learn models that may also be more operationally effective mm -hmm. in addition to being in alignment with our values. I think as we come to the conclusion here, <clears throat> the language in the national security strategy and the framing in the national defense strategy on the strategic competition the U.S. and our allies are engaged in is, uh, is sobering and it really should be the driver for the level of focus, commitment, and urgency at which we must move forward, not only to uh, advance our employment of AI, but also to be able to manage that risk. Um, the language in the, and it's a few years old now, which seems like forever in the technology space, but the language in the report of the National Security Council on AI frames that probably better than any other report I've read, and I think is good to return to uh, in laying out what's at stake in terms of who will reach key milestones in, uh, in, in AI employment um, in the strategic competition. And I think that is a call to action for all of us to continue in government, defense, and in industry. All right, well, we're about out of time. So to quick recap, we've talked about a lot of things uh, in this last hour uh, under the auspices of trustworthiness in AI, the risk, the data, the transparency, the regulation and the policy, uh, the opportunities, the risks. Uh, it's certainly an exciting time to be watching what's going on, and there are a lot of opportunities, and there are a lot of risks that we uh, need to be out there helping to manage. So um, 
I think next year I'm gonna recommend to Julia, who helps organize this, that maybe we just consider having ChatGPT serve as the moderator <laughs> and see how that goes. That could be, that could be a fascinating thing. Anyway, uh, thanks to my panelists here uh, for having this awesome discussion. Please join me in thanking them for this discussion.